So welcome back to another session of webinar with the um, beating hearts and beacon. And uh, we have a series of actually uh, two months of webinar with CPD points. And um, the last time when we invited Adrian Young, Dr. Adrian Young, for a webinar, it was very, very well received. I really enjoyed myself. And uh, I think everyone else did too. So we'll, we are very happy to actually invite Dr. Adrian back. Um, today, again, we are doing um, a bit of spot diagnosis, right, Dr. Adrian? Yes, that's right. We're but a bit, a, but a bit deeper now. Yeah, a bit yeah, deeper. Yeah, a bit deeper now. <laughs> a bit skin deeper. Okay. So um, without further ado, uh, Adrian, you can share your slides. Okay. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes, that's right. Good, okay, I'm gonna make it full screen now. All right. Okay, so just a brief introduction. I am Adrian Yong, consultant dermatologist. I did my undergraduate in uh, UCL in London, and I've been back in Malaysia since uh, 2015. My main areas of practice are in cutaneous allergy, skin cancer work, as well as a little bit of cosmetic dermatology. But what I enjoy most is in unraveling all the deep uh, mysteries of rashes. So this is how I approach uh, dermatology. And I think this is how you should approach from the basic science point of view, which will make it a lot more meaningful. So today's talk will be more than skin deep just like the uh, area of coverage that we would be hoping to cover today, okay? So the objective in the next 30 minutes are threefold. One is the uh, very traditional skin manifestations of systemic diseases. I'll be very interactive on this session, meaning that I'll be putting photographs up and I would like everyone to chip in, just turn on your mics and you know, chip in and make suggestions and uh, treat it like a discussion forum rather than a didactic lecture, okay? Then the next part will be on COVID-related skin presentations. And finally, COVID vaccine-related skin presentations, which is very uh, pertinent and relevant to our practice now, especially uh, those who are in general practice, we'll be seeing a lot more of that. So let's start off with description of this rash, followed by differentials and uh, final diagnosis, and then management from that. So let's kick off the session by someone volunteering to uh, describe this lesion. Okay, anyone? Okay. Well, is it erythematous? Yes, one point. Okay, it is um, surrounding the nasal area without affecting the nose. So it's not the uh, rhinophema, is it? No, okay, very good. So you've touched on a little bit of a potential differential there. So Betty was talking about rhinophyma, which could be a feature of rosacea. And rosacea originates, the first step would be erythemotelangiectatic rosacea or ETR, which is flushing, redness, and sensitivity. Most patients were just saying, will, will be just saying that most people think that they're drunk or embarrassed all the time. So that's the type one uh, erythemotelangiectatic rosacea. Second type is papular pustula, which looks like acne and is very commonly misdiagnosed as acne. And then thirdly, what Betty mentioned is rhinophyma, where the nose, there's sebaceous hyperplasia, which means your sebaceous glands are overactive and enlarged, making your nose look very, very big. Okay. And the fourth feature of, sebacea, uh, of uh, rosacea is that of uh, gritty eyes, the sensation of something itching in the eyes. And some people get misdiagnosed uh, very commonly as um, uh, allergic conjunctivitis, actually. But when it all comes together, you will know that it is rosacea. But this is not rosacea. So good, good start to the discussion there. Okay, it's not also butterfly because it's not uh, affecting um, the cheek area. Very good. So malar rash. I'm just doing all the yes. differential diagnosis. Yes, absolutely. So the malar rash, as all of us would know in your <laughs> MCQs, EMQs, it would mean that it's suggestive of some sort of connective tissue disease and more commonly systemic lupus erythematosus. And with that, the erythema is normally on the cheeks, 
okay, sparing the nasolabial folds. This is the inverse of that. So the nasolabial yeah. folds are involved, but the cheeks are not involved. So anyone, we wait for... Kathy, you're on mute now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Feel okay, free so to unmute yourself. <laughs> I do feel to unmute yourself. And uh, or if you're too shy, please uh, type in your answers or what you think it may or may not be. Um, or you can even say, I give up. <laughs> <laughs> you can't give up on the first one. This is a warm-up. This is a warm-up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, possibly allergic rhinitis. Okay, yeah. But allergic rhinitis would more commonly affect the nasal part of it yes. and periorbital. So this part should be a lot redder and maybe thickened. Uh, and what we call Danny Morgan folds, where you look at someone's eyes and the skin is actually very wrinkly and thickened oh. because of constant rubbing constant of their rubbing. eyes. Yeah. So we don't have anyone uh, volunteering an answer here. Anyone mm. at all? Come on. Mm. We'll give a second or two. Sure. Give me one sec to switch something off. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone? Okay. Okay, so I think they need time to warm up. Okay. Okay, sure. So we've gone through two differentials, what they're not. One, it is not rosacea. We've talked about the features of rosacea. Secondly, uh, it's unlikely to be systemic lupus because it's a malar rash, which uh, in this case is not a malar rash. It's involving the nasal, uh, nasolabial sort of sulcus, all right, areas uh, and ala nasi. And what's more common here, if I was going to tell you some hints, it also involves the eyebrow area and the glabella area. So it's also red and scaly on the top here. Okay. So okay. now that you have given the hint, somebody has said seborrheic dermatitis. And I think possibly. Yes. Very good. So seborrheic dermatitis is the diagnosis here. Okay. Oh, great. All right. Good. So seborrheic dermatitis, common. And most people in uh, general practice would kind of dismiss it as something that is very benign. It doesn't really, uh, you know, trigger much thought process. But I want you to start thinking deeper. Every time when you see septum, you must always think, what are the associations? Is this patient diabetic? Does this patient have underlying undiagnosed HIV? Do they have Down syndrome? Do they have Parkinson's disease? And finally, one that's not on the slide here is, are they on antipsychotic medications? But normally an antipsychotic like dopamine antagonist, they would also have those uh, extra pyramidal signs. They have kind of like a very mask-like faces and you'll see that the face is very oily and they tend to have septum on the, on the forehead area as well. Okay, so what's the mechanism of uh, seborrheic dermatitis? It's thought to be twofold. Firstly, skin barrier disruption, which means that the skin is dry and very prone to breaking down. And secondly, yeast overgrowth. So malassezias overgrowth, okay? So it's a bit like panau, but panau of the size of the nose, okay? And one would then look at the uh, treatments and you start thinking, topical antifungals would work, that makes sense, but why would mild topical steroids be used long-term? And that's exactly why it's important to understand that the etiology here, skin barrier disruption, if you use a mild topical steroid in the long-term, it would actually make the skin even thinner, making septum more aggressive and recur more frequently. So like how you would use oxymetazoline nose drops on a patient with blocked nose, they get rhinitis, medic, you know, medicated related uh, dependence on the nose drop. In this case, they will become dependent on the hydrocortisone and they have this withdrawal. When you stop, it gets worse because the topical steroid will reduce the mild irritation or inflammation uh, from the yeast infection but the yeast infection will actually get worse, plus the skin barrier will get, will get worsened as well. So where possible, try to avoid uh, any form of topical corticosteroids, even if they're mixed in. So, so you your first for... line, sorry, your first line here is yes. a first line that is commonly used, but not to be used? Not to be used. It should be topical antifungals. When I put plus minus topical steroids, it's only if the patient is excessively 
itching. And when they put the antifungals on, they start to have burning sensation and it's intolerable. So you can use a combination for maybe up to three or four days, but con uh, you know, make sure you educate the patients that long-term topical steroid use will lead to dependence. So it's better to switch from a mixture to a pure topical anti uh, antifungal if possible, right? But simply said, why have I put there as an option and or mild topical steroids? Because some patients just cannot be compliant enough with a pure topical antifungal because of the irritation that it produces in the initiation phase. So sometimes you need some help, yeah. Another way of prescribing it is to prescribe two tubes. So one for the morning and one for the night. And then you can tell them the night one can be stopped after three days, which is the one containing steroid. Okay. Now the second line is oral antifungals. And this is commonly used in people with underlying risk factors like diabetes or HIV, because they tend to be more resistant to treatment. Okay. Now the third thing to prevent recurrence is to use uh, adequate moisturizers and emollients and do not use uh, cleansers, face cleansers or washers, which are too harsh which will perpetuate the problem, okay? So, so basically this, this seborrheic dermatitis, the underlying cause mm -hmm. as in the pathology is still a fungal infection? Yes, the initiation is berry disruption first, which means that the skin is dry, flaky and I weak. I see. And then yeast, second, uh, secondary yeast infection. Okay. okay. I get it now. Okay. So, any other questions from this? If not, we'll move on to the next. Yeah, we move on first. We'll take questions at the end. Great. Okay. Now, I think this is a big hint. Big hint. But um, we, I won't blame you if you can't make an immediate diagnosis. But just maybe talk through it, and then we'll get closer to it. Okay. So, what do you first see? Some okay, of these. Guys, anyone? Yeah. Oh, today very slow. Huh? <laughs> Guys, mm. anyone? I myself, okay, I used to be very interested in dermatology. I wanted to be one dermatologist. I wanted to be a dermatologist, but it, it didn't give me the adrenaline drive. Okay, I think it's postules. Can I say it's postules? Because he mm -hmm. seems to have erupted in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, like the reddish part, and yeah. then there's some scarring about it. Yeah. Somebody okay. say it's furunculosis. Full no review. Okay. All right. So I'll give a slight hint because, um, as with most picture or photo quizzes, it's not fair, right? Without the history. So this patient says that they have been itching nonstop and they're unable to sleep for the last two weeks. Very, very, very itchy. Okay. Very, very itchy. Yes. So and usually. So, yeah. So first of all, you can see this. Oh, somebody okay. said scabies. Okay. Can we okay. see the hands? Okay. Yeah. So now, how does how would scabies present normally? The common sites are acral, right? So basically, between the fingers. Yes. Between the toes, and in the genital areas. Now, the reason why scabies choose, the scabies mites choose those places is because they want to burrow under the skin and hide there and maximize their chance of not being found out or disturbed. Which I think evolutionary speaking, why scabies have started hiding in the groin area first is because we are civilized humans now who don't go around scratching our groins, even if it's itchy. So that's where it first resides. And then it goes between fingers and then it goes between toes so that you don't disturb it and you can thrive and continue to lay eggs and have the next generation coming out, okay? All right, but this is not scabies. This is not scabies. Okay. So try and draw a similarity between this animal here and- This animal shape. here? Yeah, if you look at this, the shape, right? And you start looking at this shape here. Do you start seeing a pattern here? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. 
hopefully that didn't give you any clues. <laughs> hey, so you can see here, the shape here is the same as the shape over there. So what does that tell us? The patient is very itchy. And as soon as you see the rashes all over on the arms and the legs, this is actually the the first place I would examine anyone when they say they're very itchy. And why? Because I'm trying to figure out, is this a primary dermatosis? That means primary skin disorder. Mm -hmm. Or is it an internal disorder? So an internal disorder means that the rashes are induced by the patient. Not the other way around. So they're not occurring by themselves, but they're induced by the patient. So if you see how many of us can actually reach the center of our backs without struggling. So you see if your hands are going on the top here, on the right, left, bottom, you can reach, but there's an area here that you can't quite reach off your back, no matter how hard you try. Okay. There will be a butterfly spared area on the back. You can I see, see some, yeah, you can see some telltale signs of scratches here where he was trying to get to the middle, but he can't get, and there are streaks, fingernail marks. The ones that he can get at, it starts to bleed. Okay, so these are excoriated areas. And then there's pigmentary areas as well, where there's brown pigment spots. So when, if the history is two weeks, I won't believe this. Why? Because there's post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, which yes. means that these have been going for months and months. All right, so the history and the clinical examination doesn't quite tie up if the guy tells me it's two weeks as well, all right? Yes, it's impossible. Yeah. yeah, so this has been going on for very, very long and is an internal itch cause to be found, okay? So- But is it for folliculitis? No, you not folliculitis. Okay, so you mean it's psychiatric? No, so this is an itch that is coming from the inside, okay? So I'm gonna go to the next slide so it makes a little bit more sense, then we'll come back to this, okay? So the, the common presentation for these kind of patients is that they will say, I'm very, very itchy all over and I've got a bad rash all over. So then you start thinking, what are itchy? Eczema, scabies, drug reactions, maybe um, you know uh, other things that may be related to autoimmune like dermatitis herpetiformis, you know? So, but with those things, you can just jump to this, which has a very different track of investigations compared to all the other skin disorders. Okay, because if it's eczema, you start looking at allergic potential, right? You look at scabies, you're potentially looking at the three sites, fingers, groin, uh, and, and uh, the feet, okay? Uh, and then if it's this cause, you start looking at a butterfly sped area in the back and you can tell, and you can ask him the next question, do the rashes appear on, the, on their own or is it a result of you scratching? Which means to start with you, itch. And chances are they will say, yeah, I keep scratching it and it gets worse and worse, right? So what this is, this is actually generalized pruritus or itching, okay? Now, when it gets severe, it's called nodular prurigo, which means that the nodules that develop from chronic scratching becomes very thickened, okay? So the name is prurigo nodularis or prurigo nodules. Now, these are all related to internal disorders, oh. okay? So if you look at this here, we have started, we've made a start on eczema and scabies here, right? In the history, okay? And also drug allergies, okay? And then dry skin. These are the commonest causes of itching to start with, okay? And very commonly to reverse that drying, you'll tell them avoid soaps, use soap substitutes with less bubbles and foam, and then use, uh, you know, some sort of mentholated cream to, to cool. So aqueous cream put in the fridge can be quite useful or mental base aqueous cream can be useful as well. Okay, so if that doesn't improve, then we have to start thinking about internal causes. So you can look at internal causes here. These are how you would investigate them. So full blood count and film, because that will look for over here, hematological disorders, iron deficiency anemia, uh, leukemia, myeloma, lymphoma, okay? So my mentor in the UK was brought, um, he had a, a lawsuit against him for missing someone who had chronic pruritus for about five years. And that chap, the only thing that he did not do was a chest x-ray. And the chest x-ray was subsequently found to have very enlarged hyaline lymph nodes on both sides. And he had a lymphoma diagnosis four or five years down the line. 
And on that basis, that patient retrospectively said he was misdiagnosed five years ago. So this is a very challenging situation where we have to consider this, these causes initially. Of course, our society is not as litigious, but you know, it may come to that someday and you have to be very alert. So think blood screen would help to rule out all the underlying potential causes here. And more commonly, of course, are renal disorders, uremia with uh, chronic kidney disease, liver disorders causing cholestasis, and then hyper or hypothyroidism. So a basic blood test was, wouldn't harm the patient. Now, I wouldn't recommend serum protein electrophoresis on the first onset, okay, unless all the other bloods are normal, the chest x-ray normal, and there's nothing else to go with, and the pruritus is still very persistent. Okay, But if all these are normal still, then uh, you, know, you would have to refer to a dermatologist like myself to consider other methods of testing, which involves therapeutic in some ways. So sometimes we use things like gabapentin to treat neuro, uh, neurological itch, which can be useful in renal and liver pruritus. Uh, the people who might have done hepatology as well would come across uh, people have used ursodeoxycholic acid or rifampicin to help with liver-related itch, especially things like primary biliary cirrhosis. Okay, and with hematological disorders, you need to correct the underlying causes to improve the itch. All right, so we'll just go back to the picture so that it's in great, uh, etched onto your mind. This is a how this can sometimes throw certain people off if you just memorize this as a butterfly sped area are uh, the traditional practices that some of our local patients have, which are not as common in the UK, because these are described in the Western literature. In our society, we also have uh, uh, elderly uncles who use back scratches, right? So they use those long wooden things to scratch I themselves. See. Okay. So, so sometimes you might see streaks, very straight line streaks like that. And then you can ask them, do you use one of those? All right. The other thing that can throw us off sometimes is when patients start putting calamine lotion on and the skin becomes so dry and flaky, but there's a slight pink tinge to it. And then you think, oh, this is dry skin. It's astyototic eczema, so it can't be internal itch. But that's because the patient has put calamine lotion on very commonly. Okay. Now on that note, calamine lotion is not preferred compared to menthol in aqueous cream. Why? Because calamine lotion, although it has a good cooling property in reducing itching, but it actually dries the skin out even more when you leave it on. So what happens is you end up building a vicious cycle of the scratch and itch and dryness, and then you develop secondary eczema. Okay. The other thing, of course, is the traditional practices of old Chinese aunties that might be using tiger balm to try to treat the itch, and they can induce an allergic contact eczema that can develop large patches on top of this background pattern that you see. Okay, so those are just slight local modifications that you might need to think about. Okay, on Facebook, somebody mentioned Sjogren's disease. Yes, okay. Yeah, Sjogren's uh, is a connective tissue disease where it can affect your uh, salivary glands, your tear ducts, causing dryness, and it can also cause a malar rash. Uh, but it is not very common for it to develop uh, in this form where it is just on the back area. Yeah, where, because this is coming from an internal disorder. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay, let's. Good, move on. Okay, let's describe this. Uh... I can only give one hint. This is a left leg. <laughs> okay. We can also tell that. Thank you very much. Just in case, just in case the picture is not clear enough. Oh, vasculitis. Okay, go on. Anyone? Let's give left leg. Yeah, I think you enjoy this. I think cardiologists would enjoy this too, for sure. Vasculitis, erythema nodosum. Oh my God, I've not heard that word for a long, long time. Okay. Okay. So somebody said cellulitis. That did come to my thought. Okay. Oh, okay. uh, yes. Okay. Okay. It's the left leg. The fact that it is a left leg. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Don't read too much into the left leg. 
No, don't read too much in the left. Like <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's go through the three uh, different differentials that have been offered so far. Let's talk about cellulitis first. So cellulitis, uh, you have the advantage of uh, tenderness, which means that when you touch it, it's warm, painful, okay? And also, it would be well demarcated, and normally it has a tide mark. So where it starts off and where it ends, it's normally a whole entire area, which is well circumscribed. Now, what we see here are isolated red areas, right? One here, one here, one here. So it's a bit too patchy for it to be cellulitis because that would be in the sub-Q, subcutaneous area. Um, it could be something called erysipelas, which is involving the superficial layer only, but yes, pretty but uncommon. Of the cause say erysipelas. I've never yeah, heard it. Yeah, so very, yeah, so erysipelas is just superficial skin infection due, due to staph or strep, right? Now, so cellulitis is a possibility there. But the patient says it's very, very tender. Okay. And when you feel it, it's warm as well, but it's very localized. Okay. Now, let's cover the other possibility. Could this be vasculitis? So, what is vasculitis? Inflammation of the blood vessels uh, due to immune complex deposition, damage to the blood vessel wall, blood vessel bursts, red cell leaks out, gets deposited under the skin. So when you look closer, you start to see peppering of red blood vessels. Okay, as though someone has uh, slapped that area and you get lots, lots of red dots. Okay. So this is not quite uh, vasculitis, okay, without saying too much. Okay. But we've got a, a correct suggestion, and that was that of erythema nodosum. Okay, so this is a typical erythema nodosum. And it's due to fat or subcutaneous inflammation. These are tendon nodules typically on the shins, but it can also occur on the thigh and the forearm. And some uh, you know, people may not be very familiar with it, will probably ask whether they have knocked themselves or they were abused by their partners. Okay, because they look like bruises initially. Okay, now all the things here we have to consider: bacterial causes, viral causes, mycobacterial causes, so TB. Okay. Sarcoidosis, which is a uh, sort of an autoimmune granulomatous condition, can also produce uh, these kind of uh, lesions. Inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis can also do this. And then malignancy, leukemia, and lymphoma, albeit rarely. Pregnancy can also cause it. Bechet syndrome, where you get recurrent oral and genital ulcers. And finally, drugs. The most common drug is oral contraceptive pills and the uh, tetracycline, doxycycline group as well, and sulfur-based drugs. Okay, so quite a number of uh, differentials here. I think when we think about the practicalities of a busy clinic and you're looking at this, you wouldn't be taking out the list to look at what are potential causes and taking off the investigations on the first, uh, you know, sort of glance. What I would suggest though, is to at least ask history suggestive of infections why? Because it will change your management immediately. Because systemic corticosteroids is one of the most effective ways of switching off erythema nodosum. But you would be considered negligent to give your patients corticosteroids if they had an active infection such as TB. All right. In the case of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, pregnancy, uh, and bache, it would improve the primary disorder as well. I mean, sorry, not pregnancy, but bache and uh, inflammatory bowel disease, it would improve the underlying condition. And so does it in the case of sarcoidosis. But to differentiate that, I think just do a baseline blood, a chest X-ray, and then you go from there. Okay, if it's a recurring episode, then you would normally have to take a biopsy to confirm that this is a recurrent paniculitis and so that we can have a more long-term management plan. All right. Okay, so. Any other comments or questions on this? Contact dermatitis, uh, it may well be, but remember that dermatitis or eczema involves more of the epidermis. So if I just go back one photo here, these are deep, meaning that they're within the dermis or deeper. I'll give you that here that is slightly flaky, but it's not as eczematous, not as weepy, not as wet, and not as superficial. Because an epidermal change is normally very weepy, wet, and scaly on the top. Okay. All right? Yeah. 
So that was erythematosa. How do you, can I, sorry, can I stop you here and just, just have a look and make maybe a better, let us have a better description of how to differentiate. So it's basically tender. Tender, yes, red localized areas. And it's, there are isolated uh, patches as well. One here, one here, one here. Versus cellulitis, which is the whole thing joined up yes, together that's, that's right. red. Okay. Cellulitis, yeah. I think I can understand. Mm -hmm. But vasculitis, I've seen that looks exactly like this. Mm. Okay. Now, I'm not going to give too much into vasculitis. Because okay. uh, we, we, will spend some time. Okay. Yes, we will spend some time. Yeah. Okay, we'll go on. Okay. All right. So, okay. Next picture here. Oh, vasculitis then. Yes. <laughs> now you can see the difference. So let's see. This is not vasculitis. This is okay. vasculitis. Okay, so this I is see very... why you didn't want to entertain my vasculitis. Yes. Yeah. So this is very obvious vasculitis because it's incipient ulceration as well. Right? There's like a lot of like little red pinpoint dots, which looks like blood has been just splattered out from the blood vessel. And then it's all leaking out. Okay. Now vasculitis is quite um, easy to spot. However, the investigation part can be slightly tricky because the causes are numerous and you have to be quite patient and slowly eliminating. But the immediate urgency here is to check two things. One, whether there's any murmurs, because it may suggest uh, endocarditis, of course. And if you have a, card a friendly cardiologist like Betty here, then maybe a uh, transesophageal or even a TTE first or a uh, echo to have a look for any potential vegetations. Okay. The second thing uh, is, of course, related to the kidneys. So if you can do a urine dipstick to check for blood, if there's lots and lots of blood, you need to send an urgent blood test off to check renal function. Because if it's a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis or vasculitis that's affecting the kidneys, that can cause damage to the kidneys very quickly. So looking beyond the skin, these are the two most urgent things that you need to consider before you take your time and look up the literature on what else to do. Okay, Because I'm sure if you don't look at it every day, you have to look it up and revise again. But those are the two serious things to rule out. Okay, so causes again. Bacterial, viral, mycobacterial, again, TB as well, okay? Then I would jump off to the malignancy part, which you can do with full blood count. That would be uh, suffice. You don't have to do the mono, uh, uh, gamopathy screen straight away, okay? That would be the second phase if it's persistent. Drugs, if there's a very obvious drug cause recently, such as COVID vaccination, that's considered one, two which can cause a vasculitic reaction. I see. Okay. And um, then the connective tissue disease falls into another category of doing what they call a vasculitis screen, anti-nuclear antibody, extractable nuclear antigens, yeah, for Sjogren's, yeah, and then C anchor and P anchor for the medium vessel vasculitis, All right? So these are the potential causes and those are the things you need to think about. So just to recap the important things, number one, make sure the, uh, there's no endocarditis uh, infection source there. Uh, then secondly, urine dipstick to check for blood. And then you can start looking up this table and slowly work backwards to your investigations. So the investigations here, standard again, full blood count, renal, liver, then the vasculitis screen, okay, urinalysis, and then potentially skin biopsy. Now you have to be very careful with skin biopsy uh, because sometimes when you do a skin biopsy on a vasculitic leg, even on a normal healthy leg, it will take around two to three weeks to get better, at least, even if it's just a punch size of two millimeter, right? But if you do it on a vasculitic leg, you may be blamed for inducing an ulcer, which was incipient anyway, meaning that the ulcers were about to come on, but because of the biopsy, it seem to have accelerated that. And I've certainly seen patients coming my way, having had a biopsy, uh, proven vasculitis uh, by a fellow colleague, and they were trying to kind of suss it out whether that was negligent or not. And I would tell them, no, this is actually a good standard practice to do a skin biopsy. And so I think the way to circumvent that issue is without getting yourself into trouble, 
is to make sure that when if you do do a biopsy, tell the patient that this area may ulcerate and may take up to six weeks to heal, you may get very infected. But if we do not do the skin biopsy, then we may be guessing what it is, okay? Because we're gonna just be uh, treating it with oral steroids initially, uh, but making sure that there's no infection underlying that to start with, okay? So it's just a little, uh, you know, take home point uh, to be cautious there. All right. Any questions from Betty or the other participants now? Nope. Okay. No. No okay. one has said anything. We go on. Uh, I think it's because it's probably too. Uh, we cut. We let the cat out of the bag too early, right? Okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. Reported cutaneous manifestations of COVID nineteen. Now, this is an interesting one. Because if you look at it, it can be almost anything. Now, this androgenetic alopecia, I would like, I've deliberately put this image on because this is a joke, right? Everyone, they started to blame it on everything. Now, androgenetic alopecia or androgenic alopecia is actually male pattern baldness. Yes. Okay? Now, it's very common. And I wonder who has put this in because <laughs> I think the diagnosis that he meant was telogen effluvium. But I've taken this image just so that you're aware of the kind of things that you can find on the net now, including in medic certain medical websites from medical centers. These are inaccurate information there. I've deliberately put this there because we know that androgenic alopecia, the cause is dihydrotestosterone, which is excessive testosterone hormones, causing the M-shaped pattern on the front and the vertex top, which is very common. We know that's male pattern baldness, right? But what they mean by COVID-19 related hair loss, which was also recently published in the STAR in a patient in Thailand, is telogen effluvium. Just like how women can lose a lot of the hair, shed their hair six to nine months after delivering a baby, or after an admission to hospital for dengue, six months later, suddenly your hair is very thin and it's falling out. That is telogen effluvium. So telogen is actually a stage of the hair cycle uh, shedding phase. Okay, you have three phases, right? Anagen is growing. Catagen is resting and telogen is shedding phase. So what happens when you're stressed or unwell, you know, or uh, emotionally unhappy? So you, we, are, we end up a little bit like animals where all our hair or fur start to shed at the same time. They all go in phase and shed off. So that can be quite scary because you see clumps of hair in the shower or in your pillow and you think you're going to go bald overnight, right? Within two days, you're going to be bald. Yeah, well, especially after delivery. What, what, why is the reason behind that? Yeah, it's the emotional, emotional. I think, yes, and physical stress as well. That's why it's called really? labor, right? Very uh, intense labor. Is it not hormonal? No, not hormonal. It's this acute stress episode. I don't feel any stress at all, but I could feel my hair just dropping off like yeah. in a bunch. Yeah, the stress to your body. Emo uh, the, the physical stress. Because even with dengue, with COVID, they're all significant illnesses that, you know, may end you up, uh, land you in hospital and, you know, the emotional turmoil that you may have mentally uh, is underestimated. So, you know, this is actually telogen effluvium. Okay, now, looking at all the rest, periorbital erythema can be due to rubbing, can be due to ecchymosis, blood vessel bursting, okay? But without going into the deep details of that, right? I would like to make you think of skin manifestations of any infection, not just COVID, in a very immunological way. If you think of it immunologically, then you will never miss anything, right? So there are four types of hypersensitivity reaction, if you remember our medical school immunology, right? So type one is immediate type, which is a decarrier. A decarrier, that's the first type, okay? Second type is the... Uh, direct cell death or cytotoxic, which you can get mobilifon type rash, okay, macular papular rashes, okay. Then type three is immune complex deposition. What do you get? Vasculitis. So it might be purpura, might be levator reticularis, might be petechiae, okay. Then you have type four, which is the delayed type hypersensitivity, like eczema. So it can be eczema-like and can be all over the body, all right. So when you think of all those four, then it makes the classification a lot easier and the way you think about it a lot easier. So when you're managing those four types of hypersensitivity, you go back to basics and think, if it's type one, mainly histamine related, antihistamines would work. 
So don't start steroids so quickly. Because if they are having suspected COVID symptoms, you may not want to start immunosuppressing them so early. You might get into trouble there. So start with antihistamines first. The later stages, the type 2 to 4, commonly they are probably seen in uh, KKM hospitals. Not so much in GP land because I don't think they will stay out or hang out so long to become so ill yeah, and develop those rashes. So these are the rashes that uh, is presented in the literature. But what's very interesting, I would just like to draw your attention to it. This thing about COVID toes, perineal, chill blains is almost unheard of in Malaysia, even though our caseload is so high now. And that has been discussed time and time again in various dermatology meets over the last six months. And one of the main reasons we think why that doesn't happen in our country is because it's not cold enough. Because the mechanism here is you're getting cold agglutinins from the viral particles, your immune system re reacting to it. And then when it goes into your microvasculature, which are your fingertips and your tips of your toes, when the blood vessels get small enough, it starts to get a little bit blocked off there. All right. So it is simply too warm in our country to have such vasoconstricted vessels and therefore perno is not as common, chillblains are not as common in, in our presentation, all right? even in the peak of the uh, COVID cases now. But all the others, yes, uh, has been seen. So hand, foot and mouth-like vesic vesicles, urticarial reactions, as we mentioned, macular mobiliform, almost like the Epstein-Barr virus kind of, uh, or penicillin rash, yeah? Okay, and then you have the purpura, which is the vasculitic presentations or immune complex deposition reactions. Okay, so in a way, it's slightly academic because you would be normally making the diagnosis of COVID before it becomes so severe, right? Um, so yeah, that was it. Okay, any comments or questions about this? Okay, um, recently in our group chat, right, there mm -hmm. was this doctor who presented a patient that had hyperpigmentation which was um transient i mean she had it for a while it was um then it, it, it but he took pictures of it i i'm not sure if you were in a group chat but mm. it it was just hyperpigmentation it didn't look like erythematous in any way okay and she had covid okay. and then eventually her saturation dropped we mm. We were entertaining, like, was it like, you know, um, cyanosis? But mm. it was at a very peculiar site and mm. there was demarcation. It means the area of uh, hyperpigmentation was demarcated. Okay, it's not like it's the whole limb. No. Ah, localized. Yes, localized. Okay, localized, normally it's post-allergic contact dermatitis which means that they may have been a plaster. So if it's a shape of a square, most likely it was a waterproof plaster or one of those salon plus, you know, pain patches, which contains non-steroidals that may make the patient photosensitive as well. Uh, actually, um, he didn't give that history. It just that, no. yeah, he as a doctor has been very nice to the patient, um, allowing her to actually WhatsApp him mm. on a regular basis of her, her progress. Mm -hmm. But eventually okay. she was admitted. Oh, we, I see. Yeah. Yeah. I'll maybe can get that picture and show it to you later. Yeah, yeah, that'll be good. Yeah. 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 Okay. But I think pigmentation post inflammation of any sort is possible. Okay. Yeah, whether it's a chemical, physical burn or you know, an allergic re reaction that was very excessive. Yeah. Okay, so now this is by far the commonest COVID vaccine related side effect that I've seen in the last two months. Okay, so any comments from the floor with regards to what this is? Yep, very good. Oh, shingles. Yes. So shingles, so it's very interesting. I mean, and the distribution of the types of vaccination was quite equal throughout, meaning that Sinovac, AZ or Pfizer, whichever it was, the mechanism I think would probably be similar. And the only theory that we have now is that when the vaccination occurred, 
the body's immune system somewhat dips temporarily for one or two weeks. And that's the time when zoster gets reactivated. Okay, so this, this has been very common actually, uh, so much so that in our dermatology uh, chat group, there was also, you know, comments about that, that there's been, you know, a whole so-called outbreak of it after the, once the vaccine uh, vaccination rates started speeding up, we were getting to see about, you know, four or five a week, as opposed to, you know, a lot less than that. Yeah. So, but the treatment for all intents and purposes is the same. We'll give uh, oral acyclovir, 800 milligrams, five times a day. Okay, high dose for at least seven days. And if they are immunocompromised, longer than that, maybe 10 days, 14 days. Now, complications to look for in this case is if there is secondary infection. So if there's greenish uh, crusting on the edges, it might be impetigenized, which means that the skin barrier is broken and the secondary staph or strep infection in which case topical fusidin may help. Second thing to look out for, of course, is neuropathic pain. And you would start with gabapentin initially and slowly updosing it. All right. The other little tips, yes, yeah. Sorry. Mm. Oh yeah, my friend has had this two weeks after her Sinovac infection, uh, vaccination. Mm. She mm. had um, involvement of the eye. Oh, okay. Wow, yeah. that's a, yeah, that is a, a dangerous one in the V1 distribution area. And Dr. Ng says he did, he has been seeing more cases of shingles. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of different causes of shingles, of course. One is, of course, excessive alcohol intake, binge oh, drinking. Okay. Yeah, um, poor sleep, emotional stress, because all of that affects the immune system. So, I think we have been living a very artificial life, being indoors you know, treating everyone else like they've got leprosy and uh, being very stressed out whenever you go out. You have to do so many preparations, yeah? And I think that takes a toll in terms of emotional stress, right? Yeah, so and that, I think that's part of it. That uh, That's why shingles have also gone up besides the vaccination, yeah. Mm. After, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nora so, Manila also saw one. Yeah, yes. exactly. Can I ask you, um, is there a vaccine for shingles? For shingles? If yeah. it is common enough over the age of 60, yes, there is. But it can be quite pricey. I think it's in the order of about five to 600 per, per jab, if I'm not wrong. Um, I don't give vaccines, but uh, normally I treat the acute ones. And the recurrent episodes of zoster, yes, in primary care, they, they will be vaccinated. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, these are the common, other common COVID vaccine-related reactions. So this is called the COVID arm, which is uh, localized. And the vaccine that has most of this happening with is actually the Moderna vaccine, which we haven't had much of. Mm -hmm. But in the US and in Singapore, this has been very commonly reported. It looks like an urticated uh, patch and plaque around the arm, which can last for up to two weeks. Inconsequential, the advice is generally just, you know, have your second jab anyway, but if the rash has left something there, we can you, uh, inject the opposite side just to minimize any potential complications in terms of infection there, okay? But it doesn't uh, make someone not eligible for the next vaccine, okay? The ones on the left here are a little bit more particular, so more immune complex like and certainly the ones down here and here as well. So these ones can look almost like vasculitis. Yeah, and some of them look folliculitis like. So I've actually seen just two patients this week with this reaction as well. Both are from the uh, AZ vaccine. Okay, they, I think they are coming on to their third month, second dose. So, and this seems to be quite stubborn uh, because they're not keen on taking oral steroids in the initial phases, just in case the vaccine doesn't work, right? So we normally use topicals, but it responds very, very slowly. It's not, it's generally not very itchy. Okay, not itchy, but it is very cosmetically disfiguring and uh, it seems to be immunologically related. So when we start them on low dose steroids at about 10 milligrams or so, it takes ages, sometimes 10 days, 14 days, and still not cleared yet. We have to just keep pushing. All right. Then of course, the other thing that complicates things is they can mimic folliculitis right? Because it's around hair follicle area. 
So when you put someone on steroids to stop the immunological response, then you might think, oh, am I inducing acne here? So sometimes you have to treat with topical antibiotics together with oral steroids, yeah? Okay, in these circumstances. Right, so but, if you develop all this, okay, mm -hmm. is there a necessity to actually look for, um, let's say, abnormal liver function, mm -hmm. uh, myocarditis, mm -hmm. if you say that it is an immune... Immune response, yeah. Well, at this stage, uh, it hasn't been reported or there's no consensus on the investigations. But for most of these patients that come back with these vasculitic looking things, I normally do a full blood count, okay. uh, renal profile, as though it is vasculitis, a basic screen, and uh, just a urine dipstick. Okay. And then ask basic features of uh, dyspnea or any chest pain or anything like oh, that. Yeah. yeah. So those are the, the basic screen, but I don't think we have to do things like a full vasculitic screen for this reason. Yeah, because those are quite pricey. And would you then, let's say this has developed after the first vaccine, mm. would it be worse after the second? And would they would you still advise them for the second vaccine? Okay. Now, this is a very personal thing because most of these patients that have come to me now, they have completed two doses. I see. All right. But there's also another category who have had the COVID arm and they've done one and they ask for advice. When they ask for advice, they actually want to hear the doctor saying, no, you should not go for the second jab. But the truth is, no, they should. <laughs> because I think with one jab, you don't get the full protection. And uh, But with the current state of the new variants coming out and mutations, it's very difficult for us to say, you know, uh, the vaccine is going to guarantee that you're going to be safe. So it's getting harder to, uh, you know, convince our patients that if they're suffering from such severe, persistent, long-standing rashes, to still go ahead with that. I think it, it ends up being a very personal decision uh, in terms of risk-benefit ratio there. Yeah, because having seen some patients living with this for about two, two and a half months after the, the vaccine, they're still getting this kind of rashes appearing on their legs. They can't even wear shorts to go out because they're so conscious of it, right? And it's not clearing. So, you know, I can't say if someone had this reaction after the first vaccine dose, it's a very difficult call. Very difficult call. Yeah. Because it's funny that you say it's, uh, you have seen patients mostly with a mm. AstraZeneca. Yes. Um, and uh, I've seen a paper that says that uh, AstraZeneca seems to work better with the Delta strain compared to others. Mm. So, mm. so um, yeah. a difficult decision, actually. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. yeah. What more with thromboembolism, right? Mm. Yeah. I think the thromboembolism uh, data, it was the risk was down to about four in a million. Okay? Yes, four this in is one not million. high. Yeah. But um, having said that, I think we are seeing more side effects um, with vaccines more than we like to report because yes. we like to every we like to encourage everyone. Mm. So the doctors have not exactly been very open about. So this is a very nice case to depict that there are other side effects. They are not life-threatening, obviously. Mm. So the decision eventually will lie on, to, on the doctor and the patients mostly. Yeah, yeah. On that note, right, since you're you know, talking about the side effects, I wonder, do you actually see many cases of uh, myocarditis? No, from... I've not seen one myself. Not seen, right? Yeah. But no, I've but I have had many coming into my clinic mm. complaining of shortness of breath, mm. uh, symptoms. But I suspect that a lot of them mm. are anxiety related. Yeah. Um, it is shocking, okay. Um, how people are affected by the vaccination, mm. uh, not just the fear of the the COVID the fear of the vaccine and the fact that they cannot choose their own vaccine mm. is also a, a major problem with many people. Yes. Some people yes. have problems with AZAC, wish that they took Sinovac. Some people wish that they took, you know, had Sinovac, yeah. wish that they took something else. Yeah. So, yes. Mm. Now, because of course, now that they're going to start injecting adolescents and at one stage, they were worried, right, that the young men would have myocarditis from the Pfizer vaccine. So I just wonder whether that is a real risk or is it like the AZ risk where it's so exceedingly rare that you don't have to worry about it so much? I, 
I'm not sure, but to be honest, from what I, for example, my son had the vaccination with ASAC. Mm. Wow, he was really sick for a good, almost a week. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I don't think it's because he's a wimp. No, okay. <laughs> Strong immunological response. Yes. But equally, I've also heard the people who are over 50, because there was a couple whose, uh, the wife is in her 30s and he's late 50s. And the wife was uh, bedridden for like, I mean, not bedridden, but bedbound for like three days. Yeah, so uh, and he life. was fine. He was just laughing at her and saying, What's wrong with you? Yeah, my mom also <laughs> had nothing. My mom was 80, my mom is 80 plus and she had yeah. nothing. And yeah. my son was so sick. Mm. Yeah. So, so cytokine it, storm there. Yes. Strong immuno immunological response there. It is yeah. uh, quite uh, interesting to see. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. any more? Any okay. So the last few things is about the use of uh, effect of steroids on vaccine efficacy, because when patients with post vaccine rashes come in, the biggest question mark, do you use topicals? Do you use systemics? From my experience, if it's a localized reaction, uh, you know, mobiliform and all that, you should try using topicals. If you end up needing oral steroids, then go with uh, 15 milligrams, which is three tablets of the five milligrams spread a day or less to minimize the uh, interaction. Of course, there's no hard and fast uh, evidence to show whether that, that is true or not, but these are the publications that WHO have underlined to say what is the steroid dose that it becomes uh, maybe inhibitory or reduce efficacy of the previous vaccine, uh, vaccination things like pneumococcal and influenza vaccines. Yeah, okay, so 15 milligrams and below should be- How long do we go for? for as long as the patient requires actually. So if you start with 15 milligrams and if it, it looks like it's responding very quickly, you quickly taper down to 10, you know, but normally I would do a one week course straight away. So 15 for one week and then review. Then if it looks like it's improving, 10 for another week, then five, then down to zero. Yeah, but I think a lot of patients are anxious because the moment you share stars and you think, I've really, I'm already going through this terrible side effect, which means that my immune system is responding. Should I really shut it down? I'll just let it rip and so that I get protect, good protection, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and that, that's the difficulty and then, you know. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's, yeah, yeah, some, you know, the, the fact that the COVID vaccine has actually, um, it's a very, very different ball game in our diagnosis completely. And the way that it actually, you know, um, cause the immune system to go haywire mm. um, and also the thromboembolic risk because um, my colleague a vascular surgeon in Sunway also say he has been seeing a lot more DVTs mm. okay yeah. Yeah. not specific to AZ no no oh okay so AZ actually um, the thromboembolism is mainly in the brain Mm. and it's venous mm. but this one um, it is not specific to vaccination itself he's not sure whether it is just a COVID infection or whether it is the vaccination mm. so he sees about 10 or 15 maybe DVTs a year but now he sees about 5 to 10 every mm. month oh dear so yeah. this is uh, maybe is the uh, couch syndrome also. They're, not the, They're sitting down for long hours <laughs> watching TV or gaming, right? Not I see, moving. I see. Maybe. Okay. Are there any questions? Because um, this is the CPD point uh, QR code. So basically, um, if you are, you can only scan the QR code if you're watching from the laptop and using your handphone to scan. You cannot actually... Um, scan it uh, if you're using watching it from your handphone yeah so we will take questions okay so ji ling ki has asked as a dermatologist in any case that warrants use of steroid do you prefer prednisolone over any other steroids type uh, in view of these steroids need less tablets of oral consumption to achieve the same strength as Pregnancy too long. So he's talking about dexamethasone. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, I think the response so far, uh, we, I prefer prednisolone because I know how it works in terms of the dosing. And there's also more comparison in the literature. But I don't see any harm in using uh, equivalent doses of dexamethasone if you're more comfortable with that. Yeah, certainly um, dexamethasone is used more in surgery and also for brain swelling. So perhaps that could reduce more of the uh, peripheral edema effects if that's one of the concerns that you may have for your patient. Yeah. But um, dexamethasone is very uh, commonly used in the COVID setting, right? Mm, yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Reduces swelling a lot. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Ng asked, a young lady presented with Bell's palsy two days post second dose of COVID vaccine. Mm. Okay, that is also another common thing that I've heard. Mm. Bell's palsy. Mm. I hesitated mm. giving prednisolone initially. On checking the literature, prednisolone was given for a similar case. Mm. I started her on prednisolone a week late for a week. Okay. Mm. Uh, a week, okay. Yeah. Not a week later, but you need to start prednisolone early in Bell's palsy, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So I think in that case, yeah, we'll go ahead with that because that the stakes are much higher there. It's not just a rash, but you know, neurological function. Yeah. So this is after COVID vaccine. In herpes zoster, can gabapentin replace with pregabalin? Yes, certainly you can. Uh, pregabalin is more sedating. So, and, uh, but I find that gabapentin helps to reduce the itching as well as the pain, much better than pregabalin on its own. Yeah. So gabapentin is better at reducing itch and pain at the same time. Oh, sorry. Uh, hold on, uh, where did my... Okay, if you have any problem scanning your, this QR code uh, and getting your CPD points, uh, do, do message me. I'll give you my phone number here and then I will pass it and we will do it. Um, we will do it um, manually. Joni, yes, Joni? Not you are not uh, sharing your screen. Currently, it's Sorry? Dr. Adrian. Currently, it's Dr. Adrian in slide. Oh, yeah, so we... Dr. Okay. Adrian. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me, okay, let me, let me, yeah, let me leave the stop the share first. Okay, that's right. Okay. Now I will share mine. Because um, oh, from my side, I was seeing the my screen. Okay. It's really very busy now. I seem to be... Where am I now? Hold on now. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, not still. Huh? Hold on. Huh? Sorry. Yes, huh? can see now. No, can you see my share? Okay, hold on. Huh? Okay. So, is it? can you see now? Okay. Okay. Okay, this one. This is the one. Yes. So, so basically, um, let me just repeat myself. Um, you, for the CPD points, uh, it is on, you need to watch on the laptop and scan it with your, your, your phone. You can't watch on your phone and scan this QR code. And if you have any problems at all, please do uh, message me, okay, on WhatsApp. This is my number. Okay, WhatsApp me, your name, your IC number, your MMC number and your email, and we will do it manually, okay? Joni, Joni, I hope that answers your question. So, uh, Yvonne, Yvonne has a question for you. Yep, what kind of emollient should, be, should we advise patient to get for um, chronic pustulosis? Okay, I think when you talk about chronic pustulosis, you're referring to acne prone skin, which gets congested very easily. So we should advise them to use uh, moisturizers which are as light as possible, meaning lotions, and avoid uh, thicker creams and ointments because those are occlusive and they will tend to clog the pores more. Okay, Leanne Hendricks. Hi, Leanne. Mm -hmm. I had a patient with recurrent urticaria at least two times a week, but screening mm -hmm. tests are clear and she refused further investigation. However, she did report yeah. oh. this. Yes. Okay. 
So the question long is, is the uh, how chronic the urticaria? Yeah, because it recurrently caused by menstrual. Yeah. So urticaria in itself, yeah, it's actually a, a whole lecture on its own. But just briefly, you can divide it into acute or chronic. Now, urticaria normally is infective or medication related. Okay, infective meaning infections that triggers it. Now, the other common drugs that may cause it includes uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, opioids. And if you're talking about angioedema only without urticaria, then it could be ACE inhibitors, right? Now, if you talk about chronic urticaria, then by far the commonest is chronic spontaneous, which means that there's no obvious cause found, followed by physical forms of urticaria. So like friction related, which causes demographism where you can write on the skin by scratching it, the hives will swell up. And then it can also be due to um, heat called cholinergic urticaria. So after exercising or heat, the core body temperature goes up and the hives start to appear. Okay. Then finally, there's autoimmune urticaria, which does not respond to antihistamines. So normally you start with antihistamines as per license dose once a day. And then when you start to increase it to twice a day, three times a day, four times a day, it will start to bite initially. Uh, I mean, eventually. So it will stop eventually. But if even when you updose it to fourfold and the hives are still getting worse, it means that there may be an autoimmune factor to it. Okay, so for a patient who refuses any further investigations, oral prednisolone for one week maximum at 30 milligrams a day maximum, followed by antihistamines twice a day off license, which means uh, one in the morning and one at night. Uh, and you do that for the antihistamine should continue for at least a month before you reassess what to do next. If the antihistamines are not doing anything at all, but the steroids were, then there may be a hint that there's a strong autoimmune component. So that needs a further workup for sure. All right, but if the patient doesn't want anything to be done, you can't really do much really. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's some comments on the QR code now. Huh? Yeah, 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 no. Yeah. I'm trying to reply now. Mm. Yeah, actually when I scanned it, it also says dealing with pain in cancer patient. Huh? Yeah, it says dealing with pain in cancer patient, self-directed, attended as a delegate, September 8th. Uh, let me try. Yeah. Okay, QR code. Scan QR code. Okay, done. No problem. Oh yeah, but yeah, the, the, the thing is dealing with pain in cancer patients. Yeah. Hey, eh? so mm. this one uh yeah dealing pain with do we need antibiotics? Antibiotic. Okay, for erythema nodosum, you would use antibiotics if the underlying causes are mycobacterium TB, okay, tuberculosis, or some sort of uh infective diarrhea which is not going away which means you might use oral ciprofloxacin or if it's a you know sort of a common infection upper respiratory tract infection that may cause a serious uh, reaction like that then yes in those cases where the etiology or the cause is due to bacteria then yes it would be appropriate to use antibiotics but be careful try not to use um, tetracyclines because tetracyclines may be a offending agent in the first place so if the patient is really taking tetracyclines, that, that, that may be a cause. Okay. Uh, am I, can you still see my screen or it's gone? I can see your face. Oh, I see. Okay. So it's gone. Ah, do I? So have, has everybody, um, has everybody sc scanned their thingy, the CPD points? Oh my God. Okay. So FISA has actually sent me the wrong one. Okay. Okay. So let me just, uh, let me just settle this. Okay. Um, okay. Give me a sec. Okay. Okay. And she has sent me PDF. So let me just, it won't take long. I'm so sorry, everyone. Visa, visa, visa is a uh, send me the wrong one. But it's been a very interesting uh, talk, Adrian. Thank Hold you. On, uh. Let me just, and I think you do talks very well. 
really honestly. I'm just typing a response to the other question there so that everyone can read it. Okay, uh, great. Aswin, because he was asking about empiric augmenting a unison. Okay, so um, Lian, yes, Lian, everybody can get actually the Q, the, the CPD point, but actually uh, FISA, so I think it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter that it is not the right title, but as long as you put it in the CPD points, right? So we have added the CPD points. So no problem to that. So I think we can end here. Because FISA has still not given me the photo of the current one. Okay, done. Just give me a sec. How often do you... Okay, I need to do this now. Sorry, huh? I'm so sorry. Blame it on FISA, okay? Don't blame me. I'm so sorry, Doctor. <laughs> There's so much CMV that I have to handle. <laughs> yes, yes. We do have, we have organized quite a lot, yeah? Yes. Um, so bear with us. Yeah, so uh, FISA has been overwhelmed. Do you want me to share on behalf? Yeah, can you share on your on my behalf? Okay, I'm working on it. See who is faster. Right, maybe you can try this one. I hope this is the correct one. You hope this is what? Okay, so you've shared. Okay, good. Yeah, maybe you can try and see, doctor. I okay, so I everybody, can. maybe today you can get two QR codes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to Lisa, you get two QR codes. Yeah, it's a free buy one free one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me try. Huh? Yeah, it's correct now. Oh, you can, huh? Mm. Okay, good. So we have two QR codes for all. Okay, thank you very much uh, for attending. Uh, and uh, it's been very, very interesting, especially with the COVID set, uh, COVID induced and COVID vaccine induced. Um, but we have more questions. Oh, no. Keratosis pilaris. Oh, my daughter has that. Mm. Yeah. 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 So it's a problem, it's a genetic condition, which uh, basically is associated with possible filaggrin gene mutation, which causes dryness of the skin. And sometimes it's linked to ichthyosis as well, which is the fish scale skin on the shins, which are very dry. So the common topicals they would advise is topical urea, 10%, uh, and sometimes emulsifying ointment as well for the drier parts. But the follicular blockage areas if you use salicylic acid or tretinoin, it would work, but it is quite irritative, meaning that it will probably cause secondary pigmentation after the flattening occurs. And so I wouldn't recommend using uh, harsh chemical uh, peeling methods because that will actually lead to a uh, persistent pigmentation after that. That's harder to treat because you need lasers to remove the, the pigmented scars after that, right? So it's one of... Uh, educating the patient, making them know that this may be a long-term thing. Uh, interestingly, if we put them on isotretinoin, that clears. But isotretinoin should not be used purely for keratosis pilaris because the opposite result may end up with them getting more eczema because isotret is very drying to the skin. So as a temporary measure, it could be uh, useful. Uh, but I think general education is more important here. Yeah. Serena asked, what about COVID foot swelling? What can mm. be done? Mm. Well, I think if this is due to an immunological response, um, you have to sit tight and wait for it to pass. Most of them will resolve. Um, we don't generally do much there, but besides saying that it is what it is, yeah? Okay. okay. So I think we will end here. We have uh, yeah, spoken for almost um, one hour and 20 minutes. 
uh, a lot of people are still around. Uh, so if you, maybe we'll invite you back for another session because always very well received and very informative. Uh, Join us next week for another uh, collaboration. Of course, we have a collaboration with Beacon for, for almost two, two months, actually. So next week, we're going to speak uh, to an obstetric gynecologist. And um, so I'll see you guys then on a Wednesday, 9 p.m. as usual. Bye, Adrian. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Fiza. Bye, Bye, everybody. Have a nice week. And please stay safe. The numbers are still high. And worse, we are opening up. Okay, I'm happy about the opening up. <laughs> but it is a bit scary.